Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, we'll begin in verse 1. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Are those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them? Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, look, for three years now I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure. But if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Let us pray together. Righteous Heavenly Father, thank you for blessing us with the many good things that you have given us today. Thank you for our time together to worship you. Thank you for this word that you have preserved from your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, that you help us to discern your ways in this word, and that you help us, Father, to remember our place in the scheme of things as we try to understand what happens around us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So it just so happens that today marks the 21st anniversary of the September 11th terror attacks. So here in the U.S., of course, a lot of our minds are on that day. I think most of us can probably remember where we were at on that day, and perhaps uh, as the day has gone on, perhaps you have seen some of the, the video recaps of, uh, of things that happened on that day, or perhaps even you've uh, attended a memorial for that occasion. We're living through a period of time when there's plenty of national grief to go around, and I mean not just our own national grief, as we are thinking about September 11th. There are, believe it or not, there are other nations on this earth, and uh, they experience national grief as well. The United Kingdom just lost their queen of 70 years, and they're in a period of mourning for her. Ukraine is still under threat of invasion from Russia. There's been civil war in Syria for over a decade. In fact, if we were to spend our time rehearsing all the various national tragedies that are going on around the world, even as we speak, or things that are being memorialized even on this day, we could use our whole time together just doing that. But there's something that all of these share in common. One of our most natural human instincts is to try to make bigger sense of these kinds of terrible events, to try to make religious sense of these kinds of disasters. In fact, even the word disaster itself bears witness to that impulse. The English word disaster comes from Greek, meaning an evil star or bad star. Yeah, you might remember... Uh, Julius Caesar in Shakespeare's play uh, saying it is not, the fault lies not in our stars, dear Brutus, but in ourselves. Uh, And of course, there was a, oh, not too long ago, there was a best-selling novel that riffed off of that line called The Fault in Our Stars, referring to uh, some extreme ill fortune that befell the characters in that novel. Not to get into any details, but It tells us where, if we we cast our minds back to the original ancient context of this kind of language, it tells us where 
the ancients thought that terrible events come from, controlled by supernatural forces. Things bigger than themselves are at work in the events of this world. In our text tonight, Jesus' audience seems to be making similar connections. At least Jesus' reaction to them indicates that. When they tell him about the Galileans whom Pilate murdered as they were offering sacrifices, Jesus responds by asking them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? Now, this is not the only time this kind of thinking comes up in the Gospels. Remember the story of the man born blind in John chapter 9. We read there in verse 1, As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? You see, even Jesus' own disciples engage in this kind of thinking to try to make bigger sense of things. And the impulse to do this is so strong that people will even say things that don't even really make sense, like the disciples supposing that the man was born blind because he had sinned. Right? That, that, that ought to fall apart in some pretty obvious ways. Right? Like, How could this man have been born blind as a result of some sin that he committed? Did he kick too hard? Was it a violation of the fifth commandment? Like, what are the disciples thinking that this man did? Right? We still ask questions like this when terrible things happen. You might remember that there was a measurable uptick in church attendance and general religiosity right after 9-11. And there were, of course, men who had a religious diagnosis for 9-11 as well. Just two days after those attacks, Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson on the 700 Club uh, blamed 9-11 on, I'm quoting Jerry Falwell here, the abortionists and the feminists and the gays and the lesbians who are actively trying to make that an alternative lifestyle, the ACLU, people for the American way, all of them who have tried to secularize America, I point the finger in their face and say, you helped this happen. He is, of course, speaking of divine judgment on the United States because of these things going on. And I don't think that we have to carry water for any of the people that Jerry Falwell singled out to ask, are Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson also among the prophets? Have they received the word of the Lord? It ought to be obvious to us that they are making claims beyond their knowledge when they say such things. Implicating God in things in ways that God himself is not revealed. Right? It's one thing to call out specific sins and say these kinds of things should not be going on. It is another thing to turn around and say, this particular terrible event happened as a punishment from, from God because he is mad at us for X, Y, and Z thing. We tend to do this in the other direction, too, by the way. This is a two-way street. I'm reminded of a sermon that I heard once where the brother uh, began his sermon with an anecdote. A, a true story, he says, about a, a young woman who had, uh, whose young son had been struck and killed by a car. And uh, one day as she was, in the immediate aftermath of this, as she was grieving the loss of her son, the, the preacher 
went to visit her to console her. And when he arrived at her house, there was a denominational preacher there engaged in that same business. And of course, because he's a denominational preacher, he had brought his guitar and everything. I mean, we, we know all the tropes that go along with this. Um, and the, the Church of Christ preacher, the brother that I'm talking about, um, and this is as he presented himself in this sermon, uh, waited for the denominational preacher to finish and overheard the denominational preacher telling this woman, uh, uh, trying to console her along the lines of, you know, that ultimately everything is in God's hand um, and God is still in control of everything and God is still looking out for her as terrible as this event is, uh, it does not mean that God is in any less control, and, and God's, God has a reason for everything. And at this point, the brother declared from the pulpit that he proudly stood up against the denominational preacher and told this grieving mother, God had nothing to do with the death of your son, the laws of physics killed your son. That is as far as I remember verbatim. It stuck in my mind because I had to pick my jaw up off the floor after hearing it as he's proclaiming this pretty proudly from the pulpit. Um, and again, we have to ask, is this brother also among the prophets? Does he know the mind of God so as to be able to say, that that day, God was just entirely absent. He's missing. He's gone away somewhere. He's taking a nap. He's attending to other things. The blind laws of physics somehow grabbed control of everything, and God's hand most definitely is not within a thousand miles of anything that happened. You know, we tend to, like I said, this is a two-way street. It is presumption either way. Now, ironically, the brother was telling this anecdote uh, to begin a sermon on the book of Job, of all things. And it seems that the brother has missed the whole point of the book. We could use Job as a jumping off point, and we'll come back to our text in a second. Remember, it is Job and his friends who all engage in presumption to say, well, this must be what God is doing, or no, God definitely can't be doing that. Now, you're suffering because you sinned and God is punishing you. No, I know that I'm not suffering because of that, and I wish God would do this, that, and the other thing. They all, they spend chapter upon chapter, like 38 chapters, just spouting nonsense to each other. And finally, God comes down from the cloud. And you remember the point of the book of Job is that God comes down from the cloud and he tells all of them, you don't know the first thing that you are talking about. You do not understand where my hand is in any of this. And what's more, I'm not going to tell you. It's none of your business. Job, in that sense, is a rather unsatisfying book. Believe it or not, God doesn't answer to Job. He doesn't answer to us either. By the end of the book, it's Job who is repenting to God. I think sometimes we want it to be the other way around. But we ought to be careful whenever we come to things like this. Days of remembrance like today are good opportunities to remind ourselves that we don't know the mind of God. We don't know what all is going on behind the curtain. We don't know what the divine plan is, except in the broadest strokes, which we proclaim in the gospel each Lord's Day when we assemble. We don't know what the finer points of that plan are and how Pilate's murder of the Galileans fits into it or how the Tower of Siloam fits into it, or how this man's blindness fits into it, 
or that young boy's death fits into it, or how September 11th fits into it, or how COVID fits into it, or any of the rest. And I'm pointing the finger at myself here as much as anyone, because I sometimes get to wondering when things get bad, whether we're under the hand of God. But the scriptures remind us that these things are simply outside of our knowing. They are outside of our hands, and we shouldn't try to lay hold of such things. Jesus tells us that such events do give us something to reflect on, though. In our reading tonight, Jesus makes a single point from two disasters. It is not that those who suffered were worse offenders, worse sinners than everybody else. We're barking up the wrong tree, if that's what we think. Instead, this is what we ought to take away from such disasters. No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. What our Lord is telling us is that death comes for all sinners, and that includes all of us. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. Now, we may not go out so tragically as any of the people that we've talked about tonight, but each of us will one day go out, and then we shall face the judgment. Thus, Jesus follows up this teaching with a parable, the parable of the fig tree. The fig tree that does not bear year after year is suited only for cutting down. So the question for us is, what are we? Are we barren fig trees, taking up the master's garden, year by year refusing to bear the fruits of repentance? And if we are not bearing fruit now, what are we doing about it? Are we dressing ourselves to begin growing and begin bearing fruit? So this September 11th, as we look back on the terrible events of that day, the many who lost their lives, let us heed the words of the Lord. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. That's the bad news. The good news is that repentance is available. The blood of Jesus Christ covers our sins. Our Lord Jesus gave himself as a sacrifice that we may be forgiven of our sins. And so we call on every person this evening to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, to turn away from sin, that is, repent, as our Lord tells us, confess Jesus as Lord, be baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection for the remission of sins. If you're subject to this invitation, won't you come forward as together we stand and sing?